No one had a fridge, no one had a car, no one had a phone, no one had a vacuum cleaner, no one had a washing machine. So a woman's life was very difficult. They had to do all the washing by hand. It usually was the woman who did it, washing by hand. Uh, and they had to go to the shops every day and they'd have to go to different shops for different things. It was a long, big area which got bombed in the war. During the war, and we as kids, we were told not to, but we used to go out and play in all these odd bombed houses during the lunch hour and, that, and then after school. And uh, it was a lot of adventure. We used to all rush out on the street and sometimes, or very often, there was a fight. Someone would yell, fight, and we'd go around Conlon Street, the back of the bus garage, and um, sort it out. There used to be a van that came round that showed films at the back and it would stop in Southam Street and all the kids would come out and sit and watch the, the films, cartoons, Walt Disney, that kind of stuff. Um, and we just used to play in the streets, a lot of playing in the streets. The house next door to where we were living had several families living in who had one room to live in and they also had some old age pensioners who had a room. So it was very good in the sense that uh, people mixed much more and, and helped one another and older people felt they had company etc. Most of the houses that I was living in in Southam Street were condemned, that means they weren't fit for human habitation so they were due to be pulled down but they didn't get pulled down for a long time. So they weren't nice places to live, they were, they were horrible, they were damp, the wallpaper was peeling, there were insects and bugs and flies and blue bottles, uh, it wasn't very nice, none of them had toilets inside toilets. They didn't have bathrooms, they didn't have showers. So there's one outside toilet that everyone in the house had to use. 16, 20 people would have to use. There was no bath, so if you wanted a bath, you had to go to Silchester Row Baths. And you go down there and um, deciding how clean you was, you might go three times a week or twice a week for a bath. Um, my mum came here from Dublin in the, let's see, probably the 1950s. And the same, my dad came from Barbados, probably 1958. Um, so I guess this area was always uh, an area where Irish people and Caribbean, Caribbean people came and mixed. So that's what they did, and here I am. People of different ethnicity, different color, different religions are very, very um, safe and secure and relaxed. When I lived here, that wasn't like that. People who came from the West Indies, for instance, there was a man called Kelso Cochran who was murdered on the corner of my street, Southam Street. It's a little blue plaque there to commemorate it. And there was the Notting Hill race riots. And that was a very, very difficult time. The problem started with skinheads. Well, it was bad because you were scared to walk outside and things like that. You try to keep yourself to yourself and keep inside. And anybody, color that is that's colored, if they come in this area or any area, they would be beaten up by, um, by the skinheads and things like that. A lot of people stand up to them. It was a, it was a hive for black people. There were, so, there were various groups. There was the mangrove, there was um, grassroots, there was the Black People's Information Center. They were doing legal representation for people who were arrested by the police. When this area was desolate and there was lots of opportunity to squat and those, that kind of mentality was in the air where it was, it, it was like the Wild West where you could ride out and stake your claim. Nothing, the, the area was like that for a moment and the people with that mentality who came in that period are the ones to me who set the tempo for the area. And the feeling when I was living here was, um, was rebellion. We were rebelling against the um, boring old world that was out there and where people were suffering as well. So we were responding both to the boredom and being rebellious and wanting to use up the energy that you get when you're rebellious to do something about the area, make it better.
There was a civil war in Spain in 1939, you might know, so some of them came over then. The, the store called Garcia's in Portobello Road, that family came over as a result of the Spanish Civil War. My husband came in the early 60s. Spain was very poor, it was still under General Franco, it was very, very difficult for people to live then. And he came from an area of Spain that was very poor. And loads of people came from that area, Galicia. To, to London to work in hotels, to work in very low paid jobs. The majority of the Moroccan community first came to Goldbourne in the late 60s um, and what they did, they had kind of a lot of, um, they were able to come through work contracts um, and did a lot of labouring jobs. So a lot of your grandparents um, and my mum and dad, they, they worked in hotels. So they did like f um, chef jobs or um, cleaning jobs. A lot of the women um, did um, working as chambermaids. Um, and those that were here were going back to marry in Morocco and then bringing their wives over. Everyone was kind of inviting everyone else to come. It was a lot easier to, 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 to come into the UK at that time. Um, and jobs were a lot easier to find. Not that I'm that old, but you could say we lived in the Victorian days. Because those big houses you see on Labrook Grove and around, people used to have one floor each. So there was my grandma, my granddad, my mum, myself, four of us in the bedroom. We had a front room and a kitchen. And we used to have to come out of our bedroom and lock the door because people would walk past your bedrooms to go to their house, their flats upstairs. And we had one toilet downstairs that we all shared. All the families had to share one toilet downstairs. And we didn't have any hot water. So we had to boil, boil big pans to have a bath. So it sounds like a long time ago, but it was only the 70s. Yes, I came with a group of people and we wanted to do something about the housing conditions um, in the housing around here. Rents were high, people had no security and um, people were, um, most of the housing around here was private and uh, people were in, um, crammed into houses and um, paying high rent and were very vulnerable to being just turfed out when um, they thought they could get more rents and so on. Uh, where the people were going to be evicted. We called a big meeting and about 200 people turned up for it. And we decided to form an association which became the People's Association. And the People's Association took on all sorts of campaigns, mainly to help local people get their rights or improve their conditions. This was the main, the main focus of it. But we encouraged organisations like the Notting Hill Housing Trust to buy houses that they wouldn't otherwise have bought. They realise that people who live in houses don't have to be evicted. We sometimes got into campaigns with them to make sure that property didn't just go to speculators, but went to, um, went, went to people who would provide housing for the people who lived here. I had various addresses in short life properties. Short life properties, they were, had, were, were houses that had been bought by housing associations but they didn't have enough money to do them up. And uh, there used to be a lot of them in this area. We did lock the council up in their council chamber um, and we locked them up in All Saints Church Hall um, overnight. Um, I say we, it wasn't me, Gov. It was, um, uh, but, but people got very angry with what was being planned for the area. And people were angry. Committee chairman of the housing committee chairman who had a, a, a walrus moustache and baggy trousers, and he came. To, um, he was invited to come to a meeting to explain housing policy. And this man said, "Well, if you don't like living here, why don't you move?" And these people were living here because there was nowhere else. There was absolutely no. They had no choice about anything. So the people said, "Well, I think you ought to experience what we're experiencing." So. Um, we're going to keep you here until you, you know, keep you here for a long time because to give you the feel of what it's like that you can't get out. We said to these guys, literally, f*** your report, 
tore it up, we want you to deal with specific issues. There were people in the room who were homeless. We wanted them to commit to housing those people right away. So all, these were the demands we were making on them. We kept them there till the next morning. It was on the BBC News. It was in the Evening Standard. It was like a big deal. You know, local radicals kidnap councillors, man. <laughs> there was a family called the Cobbs who were in a basement there. And uh, the landlord tried to evict them. And we, uh, say we, you know, say we the general, we put up lots of um, barbed wire and put up signs saying this wire is electri electrified, don't touch it. And we had a, a, a picket there every day. And on one morning, I was just going up there, and I was on du duty from about seven. And as I got there, the police, uh, there was a, a mass attack by police on the area. You know, they just, they just swept into the square and pushed everybody out. I mean, I say there was cut a hundred police sort of thing. When the People's Association first started, we used to meet in All Saints Church Hall uh, for a general meeting. And in the corner, would be a little hut in the corner of the room. And Peter Candler, who's a lawyer, would be there and he'd be giving housing advice to local tenants. And from that, the law centre started and we got the old butcher's shop in, in Goulburn Road and converted that into the law centre. When I first worked at North Kensington Law Centre, a lot of our work was actually trying to stop uh, illegal evictions by landlords who were trying to get the poorer people out of their properties so that they could sort of do them up and rent them to uh, people who could afford a lot more. And that was a, that was a big issue um, back in, in those days. Why we set the law centre up is because too many young people were being picked off the street by the police and didn't have anybody to represent them when they were taken to court. And Portobello Road was notorious for, um, for uh, police raids and we arranged for a rotor of solicitors to be available and who would go at no cost and represent young people and uh, uh, and that was an issue and it, they were quite angry angry times. The war came and a lot of buildings got destroyed by bombs uh, but then there was also uh, a program of slum clearance um, for instance the house Treddick Tower I watched them build Trellick Tower, and that was that was on old properties that were there, uh, old Victorian properties, and all, so th there's been quite a few changes and, and modernisations. Well, if you look at this area, what is the iconic building? It's quite clearly the 31 stories of Trellick Tower, and it's a kind of love-hate building. I think a lot of people. <coughs> It's like what they would think of as its brutalist modernism. But then again, a lot of people can see a stark beauty in it. I moved from Hammersmith to Trellick Tower in 1972. The building was just opened and I, it was absolutely spotless, pristine. It did have a bad reputation because we didn't have a concierge at the time. But we decided, right, we got to get the council. We need a concierge down here. So we, we, we bombarded the councillors. This Trellick Tower has really improved over, over the years and that's a desire, seen as a desirable place to live. Well, that's not just happened on its own. That's happened because local people have campaigned and fought and marched and demonstrated and stood up, stood up for the area, I think. We lived in a terraced house and we lived very close with people. We didn't have much room, but we did know each other very well and we knew our neighbours. And it was a bit, although we were happy about moving into some place nice, you know, it was still a move and we weren't sure and they looked really new and modern and a little bit soulless, you know. And then little by little they moved us out of our bit and we all moved together into the new bit that was built. So it did mean that we all moved, and I can remember, lo none of us hired m removal people. We all just piled stuff into prams, and we literally walked it to the estate. And I can just remember all of us going along and doing that, and then unpacking. Um, and slowly we made it our own. I guess what, what changed was 
in the old streets, you had these steps that everybody would sit out on. There wasn't any common area that people would sit anymore. So you did get a little bit more isolated on the new estate. When they built Swinburne Estate, we knew that there needed to be some facilities for young children. And I had young children at the time. So we all got together with the Residents Association um, and other people that were interested and we campaigned to set up a nursery and got some funding and we did. And there was a very successful nursery there. Southam Street, where I lived first of all, which a little bit still exists, that was pulled down because the houses were so poor. But then Lancaster Road, where I lived, was pulled down because of the Westway. Camelford Road, where I lived after I got married, which used to run between Labrador Grove and St Mark's Road, that was pulled down because of the Westway. Warmer Road was pulled down because of the Westway, so that elevated road meant that lots of places got pulled down. Lots of places that should have been pulled down years ago, incidentally, but it was had a big effect. I've got lots of books at home about the Westway because my grand was a protester. Now, when the Westway was going to be built, there was all the houses on Swinbrook. All of where the Westway is now, it was all houses. And they protested. They didn't want their houses knocked down. I've got pictures. They were on top of sitting on their houses with the big posters saying, do not knock down Swinbrook. I, I remember people, all the houses becoming derelict and all the houses getting empty and then the, then the work starting and people being moved to other areas. I mean, that's the, the West Way really decimated the West Indian community around Swinbrook. I mean, because there were a lot of black people who lived there and they all disappeared. Um, to pick them and wherever they put them, you know. When Westway opened, when the motorway opened, um, the people who lived on Ackland Road at the bottom here and on Lancaster Road had, were, had their houses were so close to the new road, um, only feet away for the traffic rushing past. And on the day that it opened, people from around here um, got together and went up the down um, slip road and block the road at the time uh, that were televised this opening of this wonderful new elevated road. And Dave, my husband and a few other people who lived around here organised this protest uh, on the motorway. Um, he was actually arrested on the day that the um, Westway was opened. And um, within days the government had decided to pull the houses down and rebuild them uh, and that was um, that was quite an interesting afternoon. And <laughs> but once it was built, we didn't use it because we can't get on it unless we go to Paddington or go to Hammersmith. So there it was. The next thing was someone said, but what about under the Westway? It's like a house with no walls. And I thought when they build the motorway on this land, it's going to be... Um, they're going to put the car park underneath or something stupid that's no use to anybody in this area that really needs some things, some playground. The children really needed playgrounds because there weren't any. So, so um, I thought I'd start a campaign and I campaigned with some friends for three years and we finally got um, not just the playground but we got a mile of, of things under the motorway. We got the whole space wasn't a revolutionary plan in a lot of ways. We said that there ought to be some um, private things on the, on the site which would pay rent, which would pay for all the other things. So it, it was finally it was set up, it was supposed to be an independent charity run half by the council and half by local people. And I really admire the people that got together, some of them that I know, um, and you know, pushed for all those facilities that would kind of pay back the community for the disruption they were going to have. Huge amounts of community action here, setting up children's facilities, playgrounds. A lot of the things that you see here are a result of what that generation did as a result of the Westway coming through. When we started, there was one-tenth of the amount of playground space in the area that there should have been, one-tenth. So 
that's why there were so many children knocked over by cars in, in the streets, is because there was nowhere for them to go except the streets. A lot of people around here felt it was necessary to block the traffic. They would come out with prams and children and so on um, to try and cut down on the number of road accidents. Uh, there were, I went to see it and there were lots of children playing on this derelict land where the motorway is built. And um, they, uh, I bought a hammer and a saw and uh, a lot of nails and I hid them under the rubble of this place where they demolished 600 houses to build the motorway which is just down at the bottom in Goldbourne. And when I went back two days later, uh, children there had built fantastic buildings out of using the rubble and the tools and they'd nail things together and they'd made, <coughs> they'd made platforms and wonderful things. Dave, my husband who was here before me, um, he came, he was a student and he came um, on something called the 1967 Summer Project, so that was a very long time ago. And um, the students came and, uh, and sort of did a number of things, one of which was to run adventure playgrounds for, uh, for children in the summer holidays. Adventure Playground was started by Pat Smythe and Barry Passard, and they started it about 1960 or 1961, and it was the first adventure playground in the country, so, and, it's, and it's still going. I was also involved in a campaign to get Powys Square open to the public. In those days, the three squares sort of coming down to Portobello Road, down to Albert Road, were all privately owned. And Power Square, all the Power Square had was a, a goat that used to be <laughs> eating there with no, nothing else and no one could go in there. So we had a big campaign to get it and we won that campaign eventually. So if you go to Power Square now, it's open to the public. Right, I used to be a photographer. I used to teach photography at a big art school in, in the middle of London. I think uh, children playing are absolutely beautiful. They're way better than ballet dancers. They move uh, freely. They were wonderful to photograph and I took lots of pictures of the playgrounds and, and everything. set up by local people. There was a man called Jamie McCulloch and he was a sculptor and an artist and he, um, he was standing on the bridge at the Great Western Road and he looked down at the canal and the land next to the canal was a, a strip, a four acre strip of land that was just derelict. Nothing was happening there. So he got his friends together and they started talking about transforming the land into a community gardens. So they approached Westminster Council. They finally decided that they would give the community the land to transform it into a garden. And that's how we got our name. Uh, meanwhile, whilst the council were deciding what to do, they gave us the land, so it's Meanwhile Gardens. I can boast that I've been to every carnival since the beginning, the first one to the last one. I think I missed one, I was way, way out of the country at one stage and I, I missed one, but that was all. And now I remember Ronnie Laslett, a woman called Ronnie Laslett, uh, had a venture playground in Tavistock Crescent, and she started, she started the first carnival, and it only consisted of one lorry with some steel drums and children on it. That was the, that was how it started, and went going round just round the block, and it it grew grew from then. As it evolved, it was an event that involved the whole black community in the country. And it was a time when, as a black person, you could see yourself in the sense that you'd be in a sea of black people. You'd, it'd be like, 
I would describe it as a spiritual moment, you know, because here you are in England, in London, on Labour Grove, surrounded by black people like yourself. You can't, you can't quantify it. Gosh, I guess my first carnival would have been the summer of 1974, so 40 years ago. And it was, a, I mean, Carnival had already been running for quite a, a while then, but it was a smaller affair and people had their mass camps in their homes. So you could watch people getting ready and making their costumes in the months leading up. And I used to love Carnival because it was, it used to be like a holiday because we didn't go on holidays much. Carnival was like our holiday and everyone used to say, what are you going to wear? And I always wanted to be one of the queens with one of those costumes. I thought, but music, the music's still the same, still pans, love it. I think it's what makes this area, even though some people go, oh, we all moan. People that live in here, oh, that rubbish. There's going to be all that rubbish everywhere. But we love it, really. Carnival was more fun in those days as well, mm -hmm. because it, you could go on all through the night, they didn't shut it off at seven. We didn't have all these posh residents around here that complained, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it went on all night and there was people sitting on everyone's uh, doorsteps and chatting and that, whereas nowadays it goes quiet after seven. I didn't get involved in the politics until 76, when I saw black youths being smashed into submission on the streets and I felt I wanted to do something and I joined the defence committee for those youths. And in fact, that was the beginnings of me developing my own self as a promoter of black culture. Listen, the time that I felt like maybe I'd won the lottery or I'd won the polls and no one had told me, but I was like that high, was the first time I did the stage in Nottingham Carnival. I booked all the bands, right? I mean, I stage managed it, booked all the equipment. I did everything. I swept the entire Acklum Road the night before, right? And then we start. And there's band after band. I mean, there's, I've got all kinds. Of, in fact, the punk, I've got Carol Grimes, I've got, the, I've got all, lots of white bands, lots of black bands, all playing on these stages for two days. And at the point where I tell people, it's time to go home, everyone leaves. And the police are there with their riot shields and everything, and there's nothing for them to smash. I remember I kept looking at a pair of shoes in the window in a shop in the corner of West Long Road. I absolutely loved them. They were espadrilles with sort of gold wedges. And then the carnival came and people broke all the windows and they were there in front of me. And I nearly um, put my hand in and then he said, no, looting, you might get done for it. So I put my hand back, but I've always regretted that. <laughs> I mean, musicians, when they start out, they never have any money. So they're always attracted to areas where the rents are really cheap and where perhaps a lot of them can live in a small space. So that, we knew all that was going on in West London, so it seemed like a good place for us to have a record shop. And actually, before punk started, so, um, Joe Strummer, who went on to become very famous as the lead singer in The Clash, was in a group called the 101ers, who were a, a, a group of kind of squatters that used to play all the local pubs and play house parties all around the area. We knew that was going on as well. So West London's always had a very rich musical history. And then later on under the West Way, now where there's the food market, there was a place called Acklam Hall originally. And that was a venue that we used many, many times. And I started doing one reggae band and two punk bands every Friday night in the Acklam Hall. And basically I put on I, you know, I put them all on, all the bands that were wrong at the time, like the Slits, the Raincoats, Prague Vec, the Members, all the Valves, the Ruts, all these, all these punk bands, they'd come and play, and I'd put on aspiring reggae bands as well. But the reggae bands were always the guys who, you know, I mean, the tickets were one pound fifty, were one pound, one pound fifty, so it was really, it was in the dark ages. And, uh, the punk bands, they, I would pay them 25 pounds, but the reggae bands would always want 150 pounds, you know, they want, they say, Charman, I'm on a, you know, I'm on as a professional musician, you know, <laughs> we have to get paid properly, you know, and all this business. And you know what, the punk bands would be the ones who had an audience, 
and the reggae bands didn't have an audience. They would just, so basically the, all the young punks, they would come and play and they would thank me for help giving them a gig and they would take a little 25 pounds and the reggae band, I would have to give them the bulk of the money that I would make. You know, Rough Trade were involved. There were lots of Rough Trade acts playing my place. And so there was, it was like we were becoming part of the music industry, but like for emerging bands. What we're allowed to buy and see and hear on TV, the films that we see and what's available in the local news agents, they're all decided by someone other than ourselves. And we wanted to have our own, wanted to make our own decision about that. I heard Aswad at Meanwhile Gardens and it was, um, it was a fantastic concert, it was free, it was really loud, um, I really enjoyed the music. Probably Aswad, uh, it was um, a reggae band, you guys might not know about it because you're quite young, but um, it's very cool, there used to be a guy in the band um, who was in a very good TV programme called um, The Double Deckers. So when I was your age, we all used to watch this, this TV programme and he was from the area and he was also in that band. Um, so that's probably the one that sums up the area most for me. Hey, it was, come on board, come on board, come on board with the Double Deckers. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's got to be The Clash, hasn't it? The Clash used to hang around here, uh, you know, and which song, I don't know. The, the Riot song, what do you call it? White Riot, that which I believe was inspired by their experience at a riot, which unfortunately happened at the end of one carnival. I do remember The Riot, actually. I was watching it from my balcony in Labrick Grove, or parts of it. In Goldbourne, it's we have much more independent uh, local shops um, and cafes and restaurants, and that's it's part of the part of what makes Goldbourne Goldbourne. But all the cafes and interesting shops that we see now weren't really here 30 years ago. I think what started to change things and make it a more interesting road was 25 years ago, the uh, Galicia Tapas Bar opened up. Then the two Portuguese cafes opened up the road. I think the Lisboa was first, then there was the Porto. And they were the start of what you could really call a thriving cafe culture around here now. From having a couple of kind of antique second-hand furniture shops, we've now got eight or nine sort of interior decor shops that the rich folk up the hill come down to Goborn to buy their furniture to put in their five million pound houses. And so lots of local businesses when it's time for the rent review, the rent is put up to such a degree that they could no longer afford to be there. I think that's completely wrong, and that happens. That's happening every day of the week. What we didn't win is is to keep housing prices and and rents at a level which most people could afford. That that was one we we didn't win. House prices have gone up. A quite a different type of person is moving into the area. More working class people are leaving it because they can't afford the rents or they can't afford to buy the houses. 